Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. On August 8th, 2018, Pearl Jam took the stage at Seattle's Safeco Field for the first of their historic home shows, a pair of massive sold-out concerts to raise awareness and money for the fight against homelessness. And this was no small gig. Between ticket sales, fundraising campaigns, and philanthropic partnerships, they ultimately raised almost $11 million for their charity partners and played a sprawling three-hour set, including two encores, for fans from all over the country. And this was far from the band's first foray into activism. They've always been known as the most politically active of the grunge vanguard, and homelessness has always been a central part of their work. But it's more than just a cause. For frontman Eddie Vedder, at least, it's personal. On stage at the home show, he told a story about an old friend of his, a Vietnam veteran living under a bridge who also happened to be named Eddie. Back when the band was working on their first album, the two of them frequented the same sandwich shop. Vedder would often buy him a sandwich, and then sit and chat about Eddie's life, at least when his friend was lucid enough for conversation. That friendship had a profound, lasting impact on Vedder, inspiring him to try to better understand the complex connections between homelessness, mental illness, and trauma. One product of that exploration was the lyrics for Evenflow, which he hoped would inspire empathy for people struggling with homelessness and pay tribute to his good friend Eddie. Let's take it apart. The song starts like this. with two guitars and a bass all playing slightly different things, so before we get into the details, I think it'd be a good idea to start with some reduction. These riffs are all clearly related. If I strip out all the extra bits and decorations, the core structure of it, the model riff, if you will, that they're all based on, probably sounds something like this. <laughs> Okay, great, I can work with that. And we can tell the rhythm is correct because it lines up almost perfectly with Dave Cruzen's kick. This is the pattern they're all working from, they're just each interpreting it a little differently. Once we break it down, though, it's easy to see what they're actually doing. It's a walk around the blues scale on a bow diddly beat. The bow diddly beat, also known as the son clave, is a rhythmic pattern with a long history in rock and an even longer history outside of it. The basic idea is that you're taking a bar of 4-4 and splitting it up in a more interesting way than just, like, four quarter notes. There's lots of ways to do that, but the approach taken by the bow diddly beat is to shorten the first two attacks, replacing the quarter notes with dotted eighths. This pulls the third attack forward and creates just enough space to slip a little bonus beat in between the cracks. Here's Bo Diddley himself doing it. Bo Diddley caught a foul cat. These shortened beats at the start create an interesting contrast against the implied 4-4 pulse, destabilizing the meter and setting up a really satisfying rhythmic resolution on beat 4. In even flow, that resolution is subverted slightly, with a rapid 16th note run instead of a solid landing on the final beat, but the effect is still there. The other main thing I want to talk about here is contour. It starts in the middle of the scale, slowly walks up to the top, then quickly runs all the way back down. This riff was written by rhythm guitarist Stone Gossard, and I couldn't find if he wrote it before or after Vedder's lyrics, so I don't know if he was actively thinking about the experience of homelessness or mental illness, but either way, it paints a clear picture. It has this ebb and flow to it, but not an even one. The rising section is slow and methodical, hanging on that flat 7 as it pulls its way toward the high root. But the fall comes quickly, unexpectedly, and thanks to the flat five it starts on, violently. It's a painful, disorienting melody, made even more so by all the disagreements between band members about what it's even supposed to sound like. Speaking of which, let's look at the actual parts, starting with Gossard. <laughs> This is probably the closest to the model riff we saw earlier, hitting all the same notes in all the right places, but with a couple obvious modifications. First, instead of just hitting the A, he slides into it. And it's not a fast slide. By my count, he takes about a quarter of a second after the downbeat to actually reach the A, at which point it's almost time to move on to the next note. This reads less like a pitch and more like a sonic blur. For the second attack, he does play the C normally, but he decorates the space around it with a bunch of open string A's. 
These extra notes clutter up the soundscape, making it much more frenetic than the held notes of our model version. The third attack is basically normal, but for the fourth he drops down an octave, adding an extra low point to the melodic contour. This is the first time he really hangs on a note, letting the riff pause and breathe for a second in the middle of the bar. This emphasizes the high point, celebrating that moment of melodic triumph before falling into the downward run. The other guitar part is played by Mike McCready, And the first obvious difference is the register. McCready's part is an octave higher than Gossard's, which is really cool. It's common in riff-based rock for the guitar and bass to double each other in octaves, and this takes that a step further, adding a legitimately high part on top. It gives the riff a much thicker texture, filling up more of the available frequency space and adding this jagged, piercing quality to the mix. But he's not just doubling Gossard. McCready's got his own twist. He starts off with the same slide, but while he does still play those decorative open A they feel a lot less prominent, because for the main hits he plays double stops, harmonizing each note with the one a major third above it. This draws way more attention to them, letting the same notes stand out much more than they did in Gossard's part. On the fourth attack, McCready starts playing around with the rhythm. In the first bar, he does this hit in the right spot, but the second and third times he plays it a sixteenth note early and just hangs through. And that brings up an important point. This intro has three statements of the riff, and none of the band members seem all that committed to playing the same thing three times. Like, I said Gosser did that octave drop, but the third time he instead joins McCready on the double stop. It's a loose, improvisational approach. They each know roughly what they're supposed to play, but when it comes to the details, they just let their fingers do whatever they want in the moment. And the final piece of this puzzle is Jeff Ament's bass, which, in terms of notes at least, is by far the furthest from the model riff. He avoids the starting A entirely, instead settling on D to keep the key center feeling solid. He then slides up to A, not C, before finally joining everyone else on a high D. Although, honestly, I don't think this notation does the rhythm here justice. Listening to it, these three hits all sound like pretty much the same length, and this one lands slightly before the rest of the band. Here, listen to it with Cruzen's kick. It's full of micro-rhythmic fluctuations, too small to notate, but not too small to feel. And again, the exact details of this vary between statements, so I'm not even sure I'd want to notate it precisely. It's just kind of a vibe, with notes landing somewhere between the cracks. It's hard to pick this out in the full mix, but it adds this subtle sense of metric instability as the different rhythms don't quite lock in with each other. There's some of that in Gossard and McCready's parts as well, but I think it's most obvious here. Anyway, after that he skips the walk down, instead just bouncing between high and low roots to keep everything grounded. Any of these would have made a good riff on its own, but all three stacked on top of each other create this dense, impenetrable wall of grungy noise, hitting you in the face with raw, wordless emotions that resist easy interpretation. But of course, it only works if you can hear what's happening. To help with clarity, McCready's high line is panned hard to left, Gossard's middle part is all the way on the right, and Ament's low rumbling bass sits squarely in the middle. Each sound seems to occupy its own physical space. If I remove that separation, they all get in each other's way, and the impact of the riff is lost. These differences make the intro dense and confusing, but they also make it really powerful when all three parts finally come together in unison for a cheeky little half-bar to end the phrase. This is basically an extended version of the rundown from the end of the riff. In fact, we can see those exact notes buried in the middle here. It just starts a little higher, which offsets the phrase metrically. When it hits the bottom, it still has a little more space to fill, so it bounces back up, setting up a more final landing on the next downbeat. Of course, after this brief moment of unity, the band immediately splits apart again. Gossard jumps into a truncated version of the riff, <laughs> McCready holds the last note for two bars. And Ament tosses in this high double stop that slides up the neck. It's a brief moment of lucidity and cohesion, but it's not meant to last. This brings us to the verse, where each of them repeats their own truncated version of the riff. 
with a rundown removed to leave space for Vetter to sing. The verse melody starts with a big, dramatic tritone, Freezing! from the major third of the key to the minor seventh. It's not that surprising to see a major third here, even though we're definitely in minor. This is basically blues rock after all, and that's really common in that style. But I still want to talk about it, because this is a great example of why. Here's the first line of the verse, starting on F-sharp, and here's what it would sound like if he'd sung an F natural instead. Honestly, they're both good, but the mood is clearly different. The F sharp sounds, well, sharp. I'm a professional music theorist, I promise. But what I mean is that it has an edge to it, like the singer is in pain, whereas the F natural feels darker and a little more detached. Either one works, but the painful bite of the major third fits better for the song's narrative. And Vetter milks it for all it's worth by using the natural tritone that major third creates with the minor seventh, sitting right below the root for most of the phrase before finally walking back up at the end. Press his head on a pillow made of concrete. Or actually, half the time he doesn't even resolve it, leaving the line hanging on C, Maybe he'll see a little better Saturdays. and when he does go to D, it's in this weird syncopated position after the downbeat, giving it an uneasy sense of closure. After the verse, they come back with that half bar figure again, then the main riff returns, but this time McCready hits the wah pedal hard. <laughs> In the intro, Gossard was significantly louder, with McCready serving as more of an accent line, but this drastic change in timbre puts him at a much more even level, drawing more attention to the differences between the two parts and ramping up the resulting chaos. And it's also just, like, a weird sound. So far we've just been hearing normal distorted guitars, so a really intense wah pedal adds novelty to the soundscape. It feels fresh and interesting purely because it's different. This wah pedal is going to become more important later, but he's foreshadowing it here first. After three riffs, we get the half bar again, and this time it just grinds into a stop, like at the end of the intro. And that's kind of the point of this phrase. The pattern clearly implies a fourth full statement of the riff, or at least a solid conclusion, but by chopping off half the bar, they just sort of ram you into the next section unprepared. That could be used to build momentum, but instead the song seems just as confused as you are by the missing beats. It has to take some time to gather itself back up before it keeps going, leading to these uncomfortable pauses that separate the various sections and invite you to sit and reflect on the song's atmosphere. But we don't stay there too long. After a moment's rest to make sure we're not carrying any energy through from the verse, they explode into the chorus. Vetter's melody once again starts by moving from F sharp to C, Even but this time there's a D in the middle, letting the root serve as a kind of buffer to soften the effect of the tritone, and it continues down to B flat to release some extra tension. These four notes spell out the first four hits of a Bo Diddley beat, which is a neat little connection with the main riff, except this time the melody is moving in the opposite direction. The F sharp is also less harsh because underneath him, Gossard is playing a D major chord to complement it, although I'd hesitate to say that we've actually changed to a major tonality. The rest of the chords still read minor, so this D major feels almost sarcastic, joining in on the mocking bite of Vetter's F sharp. Gossard alternates between two figures, both starting briefly on that D major, then dropping down to a different chord and sitting there for the rest of the two bar phrase. In the first version, he drops to B flat major, and in the second, it's C major. both of which, again, clearly position us in D minor, despite what the quality of the actual D chord implies. But there are a really interesting pair of chords to use. In this key, B flat is really stable, almost like a secondary one chord, while C is a much more directional sound that demands resolution. Alternating between them gives the two phrases clearly different functional characters. But physically, they're very close, both on the fretboard and in terms of frequency, so the gestures feel structurally similar. Because the D chord reappears at the start of each phrase, you get this illusion that he's playing the same thing with very different results, emphasizing the peace and comfort that exists just outside the main character's reach. The second verse is similar to the first, with one important addition. In the gaps between Vetter's lyrics, McCready turns on the wah pedal and plays these screeching fills that, to my ears, 
seem to evoke police sirens. Now, I don't know if that's intentional. I couldn't find any interviews where he talked about it, and it's not like a literal recreation or anything. But for some of these, especially the second one, <laughs> You can really hear that inspiration. So, like, I don't want to imply that they were necessarily making an explicit statement, but what I will say is that in a song about the struggles of homelessness, references to a police presence seem pretty appropriate. At least in LA, where I live, police often conduct street sweeps, sometimes without warning, forcing the people living there to relocate or face citations and harassment. This mostly just winds up moving people around and disrupting their lives and communities without actually addressing the underlying problem. And since I know I can't just say that in a video without evidence, I've put a link in the description to an academic survey by the UCLA Homelessness Initiative saying the same thing. So yeah, I can't tell you for sure whether Pearl Jam was purposefully acknowledging this connection, or if they just thought the distorted wah pedal sounded cool, but within the context of the song's overall narrative, it's a really easy reference to hear if you want to. The end of the verse skips the return to the intro riff, instead just hitting that half bar, hanging for a bit, then jumping into the chorus, and again, the chorus is pretty similar, at least to start. Near the end, though, something unusual happens. Here, listen to this. Did you catch it? That guitar figure at the end that seems to come out of nowhere? Here it is by itself. The harmony is on C major at this point, and they're doing a chromatic walk-up with a cool syncopated rhythm from there back to D. It's buried at the end of an unrelated phrase, so it just kind of feels like a passing fill, but then the chorus ends and… Yeah, now we're into the bridge, and this riff they just planted becomes the central figure. It's another lovely piece of hairpin foreshadowing, previewing the transition while disguising it as a throwaway ornament. The bridge riff takes that ornamental figure and expands it into a full bar phrase, giving it a little more space to breathe. And what's interesting to me about it is that it feels very active, but barely seems to move. The rhythm is busy and syncopated, but by moving in half steps, the main part of the melody only covers a range of a major second. There are these low Ds in the second half, but they feel less like melodic notes and more like rhythmic chugs, leading into this big stab on a D chord. What kind of D chord? Great question. Gossard plays D major, while McCready throws a double stop of F and A, implying D minor. It's a short stab, but playing the two together, you can hear them fighting, just like we saw with Vedder's melody in the verse. They play that new riff four times, after which Ament keeps it going, Gossard switches to this quiet, scratchy accompaniment pattern, and McCready rips into a solo that he claims was him copying Stevie Ray Vaughan, and… Yeah. I mean, I'm not an expert on Vaughn's music, so I can't point out all the specific similarities, but it certainly sounds like an 80s era blues solo. But what really gets me here is the dynamics. We were just in this big riff section, but right as McCready starts wailing away, everyone else seems to back off, <laughs> leaving him feeling naked and alone. On its own, the solo has a sense of anger to it, but this change in orchestration makes it vulnerable too. It's a really nice touch. But more interesting to me than the solo is what happens next. Here, I'll play the end of the section, and I want you to see if you can guess what I'm about to talk about. Did you hear it? If not, don't worry, you weren't supposed to. Buried deep in the mix, well below the rest of the music, is a recording of Eddie Vedder saying… something. It's really hard to tell what, and… That's the point. Fortunately, I have the isolated vocals, so I can turn it up and find that he's saying this. Hey man, you got a dollar? Come on man, just some spare change. I know you got. Oh, God bless you, man. God bless you. It's a short, one-sided vignette of a panhandler asking a passerby for money and being ignored. Which, on its own, is maybe a little ham-fisted in a song that's already making a statement about homelessness, but burying it so deep in the mix really changes that. It turns it from a weird impression into a commentary on the way that society invisibilizes people without homes, treating them as unwanted background characters instead of, you know, 
people. Again, living in LA, a lot of the mainstream discourse around homelessness is centered on how having people living on the streets in a neighborhood makes that neighborhood look bad, with very little thought given to what that experience is like for the people actually living it. The question becomes what do we do about them, not what can we do for them? And placing a plea for help so quiet that most listeners will never even know it's there is somewhat paradoxically a really powerful way of drawing attention to that lack of empathy. And after that, the song just sort of sits for a while. Ament sticks with the same riff while McCready and Gossard start noodling, eventually building up in dynamics again for one final chorus, but that description doesn't really do this section justice. It's a really slow build. Like, slow enough that if I tried to play it for you, this video would find itself in copyright claim purgatory, and I don't want to deal with that, so just go listen to the song. It's a good song. Anyway, they sit here for another 12 bars after the end of the solo, close to 30 seconds of slowly building energy, before finally erupting into a final chorus, then some more of that bridge riff, then a sudden stop, with most of the band quickly cutting off while Ament just sort of slides away in that dead space. And that's pretty much it, but I think it'd be irresponsible to cover this song without engaging with its point, so if you've made it this far in the video, I'd like to encourage you to consider donating to support people experiencing homelessness. Personally, I donate to Everyone In, an organization in Los Angeles that advocates for affordable housing, mental health services, and other policies to combat the epidemic of homelessness. I'll put a link in the description if you want to join me, but I'd also suggest looking into local organizations in your area that might need help. That could mean shelters, food kitchens, advocacy groups, or any other relevant charity. It's a big issue with a lot of facets, and it won't be solved overnight, but you never know what your support might accomplish. And yeah, thanks for watching. It feels weird to put a Patreon plug after that, so I'm not gonna. Go donate to a charity. It's supposed to be the season of giving, so let's try to make the world a better place. I do still want to thank Susan Jones, Jill Sungard, Howard Levine, Warren Hewart, Damian Fuller Sutherland, John Hancock, and Jeff for their support, in part because that's what makes it so I can donate to charities too. But yeah, this is the last 12-tone video of the year. I'm probably not going to be back until late January, early February due to some uh, work travel stuff going on in mid-January, but I hope anyone watching this has a good whatever holiday you celebrate, uh, if you celebrate any, and, you know, a happy new year. 2023 was definitely weird, and 2024 is certainly looking to be another year. But yeah, I don't know. Again, just thanks for watching. If you, I mean, I assume you have if you're hearing this. If you just skipped all the way to the end immediately just to hear the outro ramble, um, cool. A lot of respect for that. Uh, unusual life choice. But yeah, I guess uh, beyond that, you know, this typical YouTube stuff. Don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe. Um, and above all, you know, keep on rocking.